I'm Matt Delhoney, joined this week, Tracy Harris. Hey. How you doing? Good, thanks. Good. We are live um, every Sunday, except when the studio is closed, uh, coming to you live from Austin, Texas. Today is September 4th, 2011. Wow, I didn't have the date up where I could easily get to it. Um, we're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. There's a calendar up at the website. You can go to www.atheist. Thanks. Hey, so welcome to the Atheist Experience with mics turned on. Uh, I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me, Tracy Harris. Hello. I'm assuming your mic's on. It is. Yeah, Frank comes storming in here like, you moron, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, and uh, it's September 4, 2011, and I'll breeze through this as quickly as possible. We're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. For more information about the ACA, you can visit www.atheist-community.org, and there you'll find a calendar of events, a frequently asked questions page, and information on how to contact us as well. There's a bunch of uh, regular events uh, like the Blood Drive and Keep Austin Beautiful efforts. And there's also some special events coming up, including our annual Bat Cruise, um, which I think is October 1st. There's information on the website about how to register for that. Um, also, coming up October 7th, or that weekend of the 7th, in Houston is the Texas Free Thought Convention and the Atheist Alliance America Convention. Um, I'll be there, as will uh, Richard Dawkins and possibly Christopher Hitchens, health permitting, uh, along with a huge list of other speakers. It's going to be a big uh, event, the biggest Texas Free Thought Convention because it's a joint convention um, and we're all looking forward to that and if you're able to make it down um, I think registration is still open and there may be a little bit of room available. Um, also we're, we're in the middle of promoting the weareatheism.com site. Um, it's kind of a spin on, on both the out campaign and the it gets better campaign but directed at, at people who may not understand that it's okay to be an atheist and to say so. Uh, there's a lot of uh, hatred, prejudice, bigotry directed at atheists. It's very difficult for some people to come out and just be open about the fact that, you know what, I don't believe the same things that the rest of my family or the rest of the people around me believe. And it's often very difficult to be, to your mind, the only atheist that you know of. And so people say, closeted and don't say anything. I actually read a really good blog entry the other day. Um, I wish I had the link, but I, I didn't bring my laptop with me today. Um, essentially, uh, a guy's daughter came back from school to say that they were sitting in the cafeteria and someone asked, hey, they asked the girl sitting next to her, what church do you go to? And she kind of in a roundabout way, hey, I don't really go to church. And they said, oh, are you, you're an atheist? And she basically said something along the lines of, yeah, yeah I guess I am. Um, and so they turned to this, the gentleman's daughter and said, well, what about you? And she said, well, I'm kind of an atheist too. And just having one other person able to say that makes it much more likely that other people will, makes it much more comfortable. Um, and so the We Are Atheism campaign is out there. Um, Beth and I will be shooting videos for that soon, as will, I presume, a number of other people involved with the show. Um, and feel free to give that a, a quick look. I mentioned the blood drive and other things that are going on. You can email us at tv at atheist-community.org. If you don't get through on the telephone today or you don't want to get through, um, that will go to myself, the co-hosts, some of the people behind the scenes. We cannot possibly answer all the email that comes in, um, and it's gotten to the point where we don't even try, but we do read all of them, um, especially if you put AETV or NPR for nonprofits radio in the subject line, it'll get through most of the spam filters and that'll be make it easier for us to at least see it. Um, in addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors a weekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. You can go to nonprofitsradio.com, that's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, for more information about that show. Um, we had a live show yesterday. It's 
currently, uh, for the past two weeks, we've been doing it Saturdays at 10 a.m. Central. We're shifting that. It used to be at 2.30. We're shifting it to 11 to allow people to actually get up and wake up before they drive all the way up to my place. Um, so next Saturday is the Austin Pride Festival. We won't be having a show then. On the 17th, there will be a show. It'll be at 11 o'clock, and assuming that time slot works out, that'll be the new permanent time slot for nonprofits. So that's all. Oh, no, there's one more announcement. After the show's over, we get together and go to dinner at El Arroyo. They'll have the address up on the bottom of the screen right over around here somewhere. Now they've changed cameras right there. 1624 West Fifth Street. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come down and join us. You don't have to be a member to attend any of our events. Um, but if you're coming down to preach, proselytize, or provoke, please don't. Just send us an email or pick up the phone and, and call in. All the lines are full. I want to get to what Tracy has to say. And then we'll probably get started with, I think, Mike here in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't have too much to say. In fact, I think the probably the one thing that sure. would be mentioned was something that was mentioned to us by an ACA member just before the show um, who pointed out that there is something called the COIN Report, mm -hmm. C-L-O-Y-N-E, um, that has to do with uh, the Irish response to the Vatican and to the uh, sexual scandal, sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church. That sounds like it might be of interest to people if you want to try Googling that and see what information you find. It seems like they're finally starting to have like a, an act, like actionable response to the Vatican and to the Catholic Church for their inaction in dealing with the, uh, the reports of sexual abuse and the reality I, I of that situation. I won't call it inaction. I can't call it inaction anymore. They took action. They took actions right. to hide rapists. Well, I mean by that violence. inaction to actually, yeah. you know, punish anybody or deal with the situation in some way that would make it. They made acceptable. it as they made it as difficult as possible for law enforcement yeah. to investigate, and prosecute these things, and they made it as easy as possible for pedophile rapists to continue doing so, just in new areas. And uh, you know, I'm, as I mentioned before, you know, Tim mentions Pope Song, which I find uh, it both funny and poignant, but. Um, I don't know exactly where, how much distance there is on, on some moral scale between being a rapist and sanctioning and protecting a rapist, but I can't imagine that it's a very broad gap. Right. It's just pretty despicable in general. Yeah, and, and it, it does seem like, like a legal issue and not a religious institution issue. Yeah, and they, you know, while, while uh, a, relig a lot of religious institutions have, have, you know, benefited greatly from a kind of a uh, an exalted status by governments all around the world. Uh, if there's if there's anything that we've learned from or learned about the proper application of church state separation, it's that that needs to end. Yeah. Um, it's fine for you know people are entitled to believe whatever they want, practice. Yeah. Um, but and you can have your your churches and your uh, public prayers, all kinds mm -hmm. of things along those lines are fine until they encroach upon the rights of others, until right. your, your protected status is such that it allows people to escape prosecution right. or hinders investigation. Yeah, I mean, like this that. is like a criminal issue and not a civil issue anyway. Yeah. I mean, if you want to bring civil suit for something that's like a civil issue, that's one thing, but, but criminal action like that is, that's a state concern. Yeah, if there was a, a major corporation or even a nation state uh, the size of the Vatican that wasn't a religious organization, um, there would be a much greater outcry um, for the actions that this organization took. But anyway, we're not here just to, to beat up on the Catholics. We'll let Ireland do that for a while and we'll keep pointing that direction uh, <coughs> as news reports and things come out. We've got callers on the line. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can, uh, depending. Uh, what, what I would ask, what we're doing is we have four lines available and in the past, we used to only have three, and so we would always keep at least one line open for either theistic calls or um, people who had a position, maybe that didn't necessarily relate to theism and atheism, but that was contrary to what the hosts and co-hosts on the show felt, um, so that we could actually have entertaining and informative discussions and debates. Right now, we've got four lines. I'm trying to make sure we keep two of them open for theists because as much as I appreciate the fact that people enjoy the show, um, calling in to say that you enjoy the show really makes the show less enjoyable. Um, I, don't get me wrong, I really appreciate it, but the reason that you liked the show in the first place was because there was dialogue something other than, oh, you guys are awesome, and oh, I love the show. So feel free to email that or like us on Facebook or you know, uh, link to things that are on YouTube and tweet about it all you want. Um, but 
we're shortened to an hour, and I'm not going to talk anymore. We'll go right to calls. We've got Mike in Detroit. How are you? Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm pretty well. How, uh, how are things going since last week? Um, it's okay. I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't know why I was calling last week. I just um, ba basically just called to talk. I, I've been meaning to call for a while, but I work on Sundays, and that kind of makes it difficult. You work on Sunday. Should we stone you to death? No, that's okay, Matt. Come on. You know the Sabbath was on Saturday, not on Sunday. I, I do know that. You okay. do know that the Sunday is the Lord's you, Day. You, you so, do, and you do know that people can make jokes, right? Okay, I, I thought it might be a joke. So maybe I'm just being. I have no interest in stoning you because I don't care if you work seven days a week. <laughs> okay, thanks, Matt. So, so last week I wasn't here. Um, you, you talked to Russell and Don, and. Right off the bat, you, you said something that uh, I kind of found, well, I, there's, I, I don't want to necessarily be rude about it, but it seemed to be kind of just a, a throwaway uh, statement because Don had been talking about abortion issues, and you called in to say that we wouldn't be having any discussions about abortions if it weren't for this problem of fornication. And to me... Uh, that's like saying we wouldn't be having this discussion if everybody just agreed with me. Because it's also true that we wouldn't be having a discussion or debate if you agreed with my position already. That's still true, though, isn't it? Yes. It, yes. So, but calling in to just say that we wouldn't be having this discussion if it weren't for fornication is really a throwaway phrase. We already know that there's a disagreement. So we need to, to actually get to the meat of why it is that we disagree and can we find uh, maybe some common ground or at least identify that we're always going to disagree for whatever reason. Right. I mean, I, I'm no abortion expert. I just thought, you know, logically, according to what I believe from the Bible, that, that would have been my answer, you know? Sure. And if everybody agreed with you on the age of the earth, then we could chuck away a lot of science. Yeah. Oh, speaking of that, uh, we were, uh, and I didn't catch it until after I re-listened to it, but uh, Russell was saying four and a half billion. I, the Earth was four and a half billion, but the universe supposedly is about fourteen. Yeah, so yeah. I think that Actually, wasn't really was, mentioned correctly. It, it was Don, and we got some people emailed. Oh, okay. um, I was going to let Don correct that next time, but I, I'm happy to. Yeah, Don said that the world was about thirteen and a half billion years old, and really, it's the universe. It's about thirteen and a half billion, and the Earth is about four and a half billion. But neither one of those are anywhere near the six to ten thousand that you think is the age of the Earth. Right, but see, like I said last week, my authority is the Bible, so I'm going by genealogies and things like that. I mean, it's not exactly, so it could be 10, sure. you know, 56 and 10, yeah. but uh, that's really irrelevant to prove there's a God or not, whether or not there's a God or not. I mean, and, you know, as far as that goes, so. Okay, we're, we're uh, shifting the mic. So, so my thing is, though, um, your position uh, from emails and from the calls are that you presuppose this God and that the Bible is instructive of what this God wants, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was something crackling. I couldn't hear you. Uh, it's probably one of the mics that we're having difficulty with. So, so the, the thing is, my understanding is that you presuppose the existence of this God and that the Bible is an instructive uh, text on what this God wants and expects and so you're taking the Bible roughly literally and expecting people to live by what the Bible says correct why uh, in what in what subject in what area Sh sure why should any of us care at all what an old book says well I, I mean why should we care what it says I if, mean I mean if you're gonna cite something as an authority an instructive authority on right and wrong or how to do things you ha should have some reason behind that, shouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, you have to pick a subject. I mean, it's so broad. Uh, I mean, what are you, exa are you trying to pinpoint a certain... I I'm saying, well, I wasn't, because I was saying, why should we care what it says on any subject? But, like, last week, you know, uh, I mean, we've already touched on abortion real quick, and I'd love to keep going, but there was one thing that I thought was a, a, a kind of a an easy home run discussion and it, it just kind of petered out which was this idea that the Bible has an instruction for uh, if a man rapes a woman he is required to marry her and you were saying that oh these guys were taking it out of context and first of all they weren't I mean it's it's a straightforward instruction but I'm wondering what context could there possibly be 
where that would be the morally correct thing to do, to force a woman who has just been raped to marry the person who raped her? Is there any context that you could even imagine where that would be morally correct? Okay, uh, I haven't gone back to the verse to look at it entirely, but I did glance at it uh, just recently, and uh, I believe the context of that was uh, as far as taking care of you know, uh, the woman that was raped because she would pretty much be, uh, uh, you know, a cast out of society, basically cast it out of society, kind of like an outcast. No, no. Yeah, yeah, it no, was. Hang on. Because I've, hang, I, glanced hang, at, I haven't looked at it exactly all the way, but that's what I saw from it. Yeah, because, and, you know, and, and Mike, if you had bothered, yeah. I, I, you're partially right. You're partially right. Um, when I said no, it was women were property of their father, and by virtue of her having been raped, she was now valueless in attaining bride price and things and being able to work out deals because he had stolen her virginity. And so the man was required to marry her. This was, a, this was about uh, essentially the fact, not so much that she would be outcast, but that she would no longer be a good virgin to offer as a bride to somebody. Um, but well, she would have been looked down upon, too. That's what I mean. Uh, okay. Yeah, for being raped. Sure. Okay, right, exactly. so, you ha so you have a woman that's been raped, and, and maybe she would have been looked down upon for being raped, um, which, I don't know, that to me seems completely immoral as well. But how does any of that make forcing her to marry her rapist a morally correct thing? It was just to take care of her, uh, you know, basically because of the fact that she was raped. Uh, she would... Pretty much, I mean, it was almost like, from what I gathered, I, I got to go back and look at it again. Mike, uh, uh, Mike. It was basically that nobody would want to marry her is what I meant. And okay, then I heard some, you know, fine, I don't but that's care. What I meant by that. Mike, you know? it doesn't matter, that's my point. Oh, okay, I mean, what is that, I mean, what are you trying to, uh, I mean, since the Bible is not your authority and you don't believe it anyway, Correct. what are you trying to... What, uh, what are you I'm trying, trying to, to dem I, I, I can explain really easy. I'm trying to trying to demonstrate how stupid it is for anybody to cite it as an authority on an issue like that. And when when we say, for example, that the Bible gives an instruction that if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her, and we look at that and say, "Holy crap! Here's a here's a woman who's just been raped." And instead of punishing, for example, the individual who raped her, um, instead, we're going to punish the victim by making her live the rest of her life with the person who just raped her. No. Now, there is no moral context in which I think that is a good thing. And therefore, it is a shotgun, easy argument to show that the Bible is flawed on moral grounds on some position. Uh, from what I can read, though, I don't think she's forced to marry him. I, I got to look at uh, uh, look at it again, but I, I believe that she wasn't forced to. It, was, it wasn't He's that she to had her. to. Yes, absolutely. He, yes, he is I got to look forced. at it again, Matt, and I could talk to you about that. But that, that's basically what I guess. Okay, <clears throat> Mike, are you just going to avoid it? Can Can you think of any context in which it would be morally correct to force a man to rape the woman or marry the woman he raped? No, no, I, like, that's what I was saying. So you're it's saying that the Bible no, no, is morally correct? He that's is. The man is. That's the law. The law was that he had to marry her. Okay, okay. Th those are, uh, there are some civil laws that were uh, back then that, you know, we don't have now. You know, things this like isn't a law of Moses, on. though. This wasn't, this wasn't just like just civil mm -hmm. law that the Hebrews made up. I mean, this was the, the law, the, the religious law. Right, and God, God always went around. You know, if you look, he, always, he also went around uh, a lot of, uh, you know, depravity and... You know things like that, like, like it's the slavery issue. That's a, that's another one. Yes, right there. He the has Bible, to actually go around a lot of things. So there's, there's the the Bible explicitly sanctions slavery. How is that moral? Well, I mean, you you know, Matt, that there was some slavery that you know you, you would be sold for six days, and then the seventh day you no would no get no out. no 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 no. Yes. Listen, listen to of. me. Listen to me, Mark, because one of Mike, us knows Mike. the Bible. Mike, sorry. One of us knows the Bible and the other one doesn't. There's two different issues about slavery in the Bible. There's the general instructions for slavery stating who you can enslave and those and how long you can keep them. And then there's a special section about enslaving your fellow Jews. It is the Jews who can be enslaved for six years and then have to be let go in the seventh year unless you get them a wife and they say they want to stay with you, in which case you, you you pierce their ear and they are your property forever. The Bible explicitly, though, allows you to enslave non-Jews 
forever, stating that they are your property and can be passed on to your children, and that you can beat them as long as they don't die within two or three days. All of this is in right. the Bible. How is any of it moral? Okay, none of that slavery is a slavery that we think, you know, here in the, in the Western Mike, culture. You could beat not, them it's near not, to death. Not, and remember, the slaves were supposed to be treated correctly if no. they were bond servants like Peter. Mike, you're on hold. I apologize because I realize you can't hear the, the mic when you're talking. But it doesn't matter. Your, your claim that this isn't like the slavery that we that we know from American history is complete and total bullshit. I just told you it says that you can beat them and that they are your property. How is it moral to have another human being as property and be permitted to beat them? I don't care if they beat them regularly. I don't care if they were nice to them on the Sabbath. How is it moral to say that one human being can own another human being as property and beat them? No, they were actually not supposed to. Uh, if they actually hurt them, they were actually to be stoned. And so uh, you're you're mixing up. The, like I said, you know, last week I was talking about contact. I tell you what, Mike, you're, you're mixing things up, man. We have you have to go through. Let's Mike, go through everything in detail if you really want to know. No, Mike, I, I mean, really do. You really want to know? I mean, I Mike, think if the Bible, the, if, Mike, I really do know. You're the one who called in last week citing the Bible and didn't bother to read a word of it to back up your position between last week and this week. One of us spent a great deal of time actually studying the Bible. One of us has actually read it. One of us was studying to be a minister. One of us has actually taught the Bible. And I'm telling you, it explicitly says this, and you're coming up with excuses about how it might also say that you're supposed to be nice, or how it might also say that if you beat them, you're supposed to make amends. I don't care if it says you're supposed to make amends. I'm saying the Bible explicitly sanctions owning another person as property and permitting you to beat them is that moral or not man i just answered you I, I is guess it you moral or know. not Hold on, and, and one thing I, I want to go back to your call back next week is it moral or not that's a yes or no question yeah and before you call back please look up the yes. passage about how badly they can be beaten before you say that you know you you had to be nice because when you when i'm told that i can beat somebody to the point that that they it's okay as long as they don't die from it Within a certain, within a couple of days, I yeah, mean, two, they days. could die in a week from it, and and I'm still legally okay. So make sure you you understand what's in there before you call back. Yeah, if you're going to call and advocate the Bible as a moral source and a moral guidance, you better have all your shit together before you call in. And this is easy enough to Google. Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, it's, this is trivial. It's not like I went after some obscure thing. This is this is the law that is written there very clearly. It's Christian, Christian scholars, the people who have actually studied this, um, have been trying a, a gazillion different types of apologetics, all of which ultimately fail. But my question was simple. Is this moral or not? And the reason Mike wouldn't answer it is the same reason that Christians all around the world avoid this question. It's because they intrinsically understand that it's not moral, and they cannot reconcile this with the fact that it's in a Bible that they want to adhere to as a literal moral guide. And the simple solution is to chuck the Bible out, because we don't need it for anything. Even if there were things that, in, that are true, which I, there undoubtedly are. Even if there are things in it that are good, which there undoubtedly are. They're not good because they're in the Bible. They're not good because they come from a God. They are good because they are good. And they are something that we can discover without ever appealing to an old book and without having to tap dance around and sacrifice our humanity to make excuses about how we treat rape victims and how we own people as property and how there's some grand context in which all of this isn't very bad. You have sacrificed your humanity for the sake of genuflecting to your religion and it's abominable. Don't call back until you actually read it either be able to back up a point with something other than a tap dance or concede a point and move on. That's it. You're done, Mike. Next. William in Bolivia, North Carolina, how are you? Pretty good, are you? I'm tired now. <laughs> tired? Oh, that's not good. Anyway, the reason why I'm calling is I was in that area that got hit by Irene about last week. Yeah. And everybody is talking about how either God, A, blessed this place by allowing survivors or B, 
he cursed us because we're all wicked or whatever, either way. I'm just wondering, like, how forceful, mainly with the people who, like, kind of did get damaged and are on an emotional, fragile level, how forceful I should be. Like, no, it just happened. That sounds about forceful enough to me. I don't, I, what? I said that sounds about forceful enough for me. I mean, right. well, I don't know. If your house recently destroyed or whatever, and sure. you're not an emotional wreck of some sort. It, it, to me, it's pretty straightforward. Um, somebody's in, in a hospital dying. My goal is not to rush in there and ask them if they've stopped believing in Jesus, uh, you know, just right. before and and so to somebody who is suffering a loss from a hurricane or whatever um i don't run around you know knocking on well there's not that many doors left to knock on but uh as they come back into town i'm not sitting there saying no this wasn't an act of god please don't be silly um but if people make comments like you know michelle bachman did although she tried to write it off as a joke saying that the earthquake in virginia and hurricane was was God uh, warning the country or whatever. Um, right. Public figures who make broad statements like this, um, they deserve to be challenged openly and frequently. And Russell made a brilliant point yesterday on nonprofits that not only is it amusing that they immediately interpret these things as a message from God, but they are the ones who understand the message and are on the right side of it. I mean, it's, it's, is there any reason we shouldn't say that um, this was a message from Poseidon to Governor Perry that he should stop praying to Jesus because he's praying all the rain away from Texas? <laughs> Um, right. But, but to the people who have lost what they own um, and are dealing with this, if it's just somebody saying, you know, I, I think it's God sending us a message, okay, I don't see why you think that. I don't think so. Um, let's move on and actually, I don't know, get busy rebuilding. Right. I mean, I guess that does make sense. But, I mean, well, it's another thing where I can also think of how God or the belief in God might have punished them because before the hurricane, a bunch of people were saying, oh, we're going to be okay, and some of it was time and flat. God would bless us and protect us, and I actually got right, you know, outright, like, how do you know? I don't know about you, but I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, sort of uh, it's, you know, both sides of a football game pray, and one of them wins, so... Was God really happy with that team or angry at the other? I mean, if this hurricane comes through and tears up the United States, um, you know, was, was, was that God sending a message to the United States? Was it Poseidon sending a message to Perry? Was it uh, God favoring people in Afghanistan and trying to, you know, destroy the United States? I mean, you can look at these any way you want. So our, our duty is to try and figure out, okay, do any of these claims mesh with reality? Do we have any way of determining if any of them are true? And if the answer is no, then they're a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's good luck telling them or anybody who tells me that, but I'll see you. <laughs> I guess I'll try some of that relay the word of Matt to <laughs> anybody who tries to tell me that God protected me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, God's evidently done all kinds of things for me since I stopped believing in him. It's shocking how many times I'm told in email how God is doing all this wonderful, I mean, my fiance, we're getting married in October, um, new jobs, better pay, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, God has really just heaped blessings on me for being a, a blaspheming uh, non-believer. But, you know, on the other <laughs> hand, I'll get an email from somebody saying that, you know, God's punishing me by doing X, Y, or Z. Um, as, long as, as long as both possibilities uh, are without support, then they're equally time-wasting. <laughs> I'd say. Yeah. Anyway, thanks a lot for calling, and we're glad you're safe. All right, no problem. As a reminder, we got 30 minutes or so left in the show. Any, any atheist or atheist-friendly person who'd like to can join us at El Arroyo uh, on Fifth Street after the show's over. Um, and that's it. Do you want to you just take the next call? Sure, who do we sure. have? We got Greg in Knoxville. How are you? Hi, Matt. Uh, I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Good. I love Knoxville. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, I'm just calling in. I'm a big fan of the show. I've been watching uh, for a long period of time. Um, however, I, I am calling in, and I will say that you're very good at kind of, you know, asking questions of the theist and trying to ex expose any weaknesses 
in uh, their arguments are showing, you know, some of the absurdity of some of the positions. Mm -hmm. But I did want to call in to ask you, you know, uh, about your own worldview. Okay. In particular, um, are you a materialist? That is, do you believe that all that exists is matter and energy? As opposed to what? See, this is a, one of the strategies that's employed a lot, is it's yeah. always putting the question back on the caller. Well, it, it's so part, I'm it's, wondering what, what it's part in of your the, own worldview, Matt, sure. what, can you account for what exists? I mean, it's an existence question. I, I, it's not I, what does not exist. I, I understand. You know, I, 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 understood, okay, go ahead. I understood the question. Um, I'm a methodological naturalist, not a philosophical naturalist. Do you know the difference? Um, well, maybe I, I, I can, ex what, I can what explain is real the quick. Difference? Sure. Philosophical naturalism holds that the natural world, matter and energy, is all that actually exists. Methodological naturalism is what science is based on, which is that the, the, the natural world, being matter and energy, is all that we can address as we're going through. And that's my position. Not that the supernatural doesn't exist, but that there's no reason to believe that the supernatural exists until such time as we can... We shouldn't believe anything until you can demonstrate it in some way. And so I'm not, in, I'm not a, a hard materialist in the sense that I would assert that supernatural things like gods do not exist, that it's an impossibility. My position is that if they exist, Either we have some way to detect and identify this because they manifest in reality in some way, or we don't. If we don't, then their existence is indistinguishable from their non-existence, and it's a moot point. If we do, then we should be able to find evidence, and until we do find evidence for one of those supernatural claims, there's no reason to believe it. You can't be justified. So it's not about asserting absolute certainty that nothing supernatural exists. It's about saying, I'm going to deal with reality and base my positions on evidence and what is demonstrably true. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that, um, okay, I did have another question. Sure. Uh, do you agree with Daniel Dennett when he says yes. um, that somehow the brain must be the mind? That is, that somehow the matter, the gray matter, um, you know, inside of our skull is somehow generating our conscious thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Yeah, you, you, yes. Um, and you probably didn't hear me, but I said yes as soon as you said, do you agree with Daniel Dennett? Because the odds are about okay. 90, 98 percent or so that I'm going to agree with Dan Dennett. Okay, I understand that. You know, he. But yes, he in that particular wrong case. On something. Yes, he um, may be wrong. Yeah. Well, the, the natural question is. Um, how is it that we then have, you know, well, do you believe that we have free will? Depends on how you define free will. Um, okay. Generally speaking, the libertarian idea of free will, no, I don't think we do. Do, do I think we have free will in a compatible sense? Um, yeah, I pretty much agree with Dennett on that subject. It, it becomes kind of a matter of definition. The more we find okay. out, the more we find out through neuroscience about how the brain actually works, and, and we, we're discovering that decisions that we think we're making are actually made before we think we're making them, which uh, it, it, to me kills off any claim about the libertarian free will, um, that there is some acting agent who is uh, consciously making decisions, and, uh, but that doesn't kill off the compatibilist idea of free will, which is essentially about accountability, about um, it's kind of a practical solution to to the dilemma. But my view on free will isn't set in stone. I mean, matter of fact, my view okay. on almost anything isn't set in stone. I'm open to having my mind changed, but it'll be changed by evidence and sound argument. Okay, I definitely got you. And I'm just trying to point to maybe certain tensions uh, that, that might actually uh, be... You know, there might be certain tensions within your own world view, is what I'm saying, is it? Like what? Um, well, on the one hand, you know, if our consciousness, if our mind is just uh, generated from uh, gray matter, you know, inside of our brains, and since it is matter, it's subject to the laws of physics and chemistry, mm -hmm. 
you know, how do you escape um, from the, the, the conclusion that our, our choices and our actions would also be subject to the laws of chemistry? I and just, then you're, I just said you're I did. What is it? Go ahead. I, I kind of just said that I didn't. Okay, so all of our actions and all of our choices are basically bound within the laws of physics and chemistry. Yeah, as far as I can tell. Okay. Um, well, that's kind of an interesting position, and these are the kinds of things that aren't quite exposed um, on the program very often. You know, very often you are dealing with uh, what other people claim to be true, and here now we're getting down to what you actually believe. Sure. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, but there's not much room there for... Uh, freedom of choice. You know, we know certain things about the laws of physics and chemistry, and where does choice come in? Yeah, you, you want to know one of the reasons why it doesn't come up? It's because it's not relevant. Um, my my view on this particular subject isn't in any way tied to my atheism. It's not, or it's not dependent upon my atheism. It's not a view of atheism because there are no views of atheism apart from the disbelief of claims about gods. And so, it's and it's also not necessarily a, a settled issue. Yeah, I should point out that a, a deist could actually believe exactly what Matt has described throughout this conversation. Yeah, I mean that you could believe in God and still believe exactly everything Matt has just said seems reasonable to him. Not only that, but a, I've met a Calvinist preacher who agrees with me on everything I just said. Yeah, and he is a Christian. And a, and, a and the the format of the show is generally to talk about atheist theist issues and. That's why this would not be that relevant. I mean, certainly you could talk about it, and free will is something that religion discusses. If you wanted to talk about that, you could. But in the end, whether or not a person believes in God is not going to determine their view on this. It could impact it depending on the God model that they go with. But um, okay. ultimately, a person could believe in God and believe all of the, you know, believe everything Matt is saying is reasonable, or a person could believe in God and think that it's not correct, or a person could be an atheist and believe that you have. Uh, you know, some sort of agency beyond what Matt is talking about, or that they accept, you know, it's like there's these, the four categories, I guess, that you could have in this. You could be atheist or theist and agree or disagree with whatever Matt has just described. Yeah, and the same is generally true for things like evolution. Yeah. Um, any, any number of things. That's why I often call them red herrings. Like, people get hung up in these long, long arguments over these things that are like sidelines, and at the end of it, you know, I mean, certainly it could impact a specific individual depending on what it means to that person, but I, uh, I had a dialogue, for example, an email with a young man who wrote in, he was describing uh, why do human beings have like this different capacity to reason. And when, he, when I asked him about what specifically he was talking about, he started to talk about what other animals can't do. So I started sending him links about what these animals can do, which was what he was saying they couldn't do. And this went on for two or three notes. And then finally, at the end of it, I said, you know, before I go any more with this, let me just ask if I can demonstrate to your satisfaction that animals can do what you're saying that they don't, and you're saying that you think that the, the way humans reason is sufficiently different that this convinces you a god exists, and yet you keep giving me examples of what animals are unable to do that I keep giving you examples they can do. If I can keep giving you those examples and show you that animals can reason to a capacity that you heretofore didn't think they could, will you stop believing in God? In other words, is your belief in God contingent on this really? And he didn't write back. So, I mean, if, if a person starts to argue about evolution, the, one of the early questions before you start spending hours and hours and weeks in a dialogue is, if you were convinced that evolution was true, would you stop believing in God? And if the person says, no, I would still believe in God, it wouldn't change my mind, then why are you having the conversation with that particular person? Now, if they said yes, We're you know, this, yeah, if they said no, if, 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 if the earth isn't 6,000 years old and you can demonstrate to me that it's, that it's older, yeah, and I'm willing to look at evidence, um, and I will, it'll really shake the foundations of my faith if you can show me that, then you have a good reason to, to engage in that dialogue and spend that time. But, you know, make sure that yeah. the person who's putting it forward and saying, this is what convinced me a God exists, is being honest with you. Because sometimes they're throwing out apologetics that they've learned, and really if they look inside themselves, they'll realize that even if they lose that battle, they're still going to believe in the war that, you know, God exists. And, and one kind of yeah. last quick thing, Greg, um, because, because you're the kind of short blurb that was originally uh, listed with your call is that we talk so much about what theists believe and not so much about what we believe. Um, as somebody who has many times pointed out that 
I, I do have beliefs. I think beliefs are important. I think beliefs are the correct thing to address because beliefs inform our actions. I actually did a lecture um, on belief that's available either on YouTube or on um, the old Google video. If you go to the ACA website and go to the lecture section and then click in the archive, you'll scroll down and you'll see one that says Matt Dillahunty and then it says belief. It's kind of, it, there's, it starts with a little bit of logic, some Venn diagrams to describe how I'm defining belief and knowledge and what the, what the relationship is. But the important part that, uh, that I, I've used a couple of times, I think I actually use it, um, I, and matter of fact, I know I did at the Texas Free Thought, at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention. Um, the video is now up for that, thanks to the Thinking Atheist. Um, towards the end of it, I cut and pasted that section from my belief lecture, which is a quick run through of things that I do believe about us, uh, about reality, and about our place mm -hmm. in reality and the interaction. So th there is a lot out there about what we actually, or what I actually believe. Um, okay. And I think it's important. Yeah, great. Cause yeah, um, and um, did you get, what was the link one more time on that, or? Oh, um, I, I, you can email me, and I'll try and look up okay, things, but the, but the best thing to yeah. do is just to Google, it, you can either go to atheist-community.org and look in the lecture series for my lecture on belief, or probably the best thing to do is to go on YouTube and look up Oklahoma Free Thought Convention Matt Dillahunty, and that talk um, includes this along with some other things. Okay, great. Because, uh, you know, I have noticed that a lot of times it is uh, easier to maybe tear down, you know, other world views when you, when you see, you know, either contradiction or but it's point not. out an absurdity or something like that. It's very hard to construct a world view, and especially one, you know, where it's largely based on, uh, you know, material and things like that. You know, it's very difficult to even give an account for the laws of logic, you know, and reason. And the show opens up every week with, uh, you know, a song, I, I know. Uh, Won't You Listen to Reason, and I've heard you uh, very often, you know, especially when you're talking about Matt Slick and others, and they ask you what exactly is reason, and the only thing you're able to respond is, you know, it's uh, non-physical. No, I, I don't think I would ever say that when asked what is reason. Um, but anyway, let me let me hit this real quick. Your, your idea that it's somehow easier to tear down some other worldview than it is to state your own, um, that may or may not be true, but that's not the, the thing that you're missing is that atheism is not a worldview. It is not a worldview at all. It's not a philosophy. It's not a collection of positions. There's no tenets, no dogmas, no unifying positions or collection of positions. It is a single position with response to theism. Now, that said, who atheists are and what we do, and as generally as a group um, or among the subgroups of atheists, there are many that share many of the same views, and so that becomes something. I don't want to sound like necessarily a dictionary atheist, like this is all atheism is, is this response to theism. Because I think that denies the fact that we are human beings and that we do have a worldview. My worldview is consistent with my atheism, but not necessarily contingent upon it. And is it there, I mean, the real question is, is, is it internally consistent? And that's what I've tried to do uh, throughout the conversation, because you it, know... But it doesn't know, matter. But it, it, but it doesn't matter in much the same way that you said um, it doesn't matter if your uh, worldview is internally consistent? No, no, let me finish. Okay, sorry, go ahead. It doesn't matter in much the same way that you said it's often difficult to give account for X, Y, and Z. Um, yes, I would always advocate a, a worldview that is internally consistent, but my primary uh, advocation is for a worldview that is externally consistent. A worldview, uh, your view of perception should match reality as closely as possible. We're not always going to be able to get rid of inconsistencies. But the inability of a worldview to give an account for something is not a fault or a failing of that worldview. Because it's not necessary for me to be able to give an account for, let's say, evolution. But up until we knew about the process for evolution, we didn't have an explanation for it. But the fact that it occurred and the fact that we had observed it and the fact that our worldview encompassed the idea that species change even if we don't know the mechanism, doesn't make our worldview invalid. It just makes it incomplete. And newsflash, 
every worldview will always be incomplete. That is our that is one of the, uh, that is what we do. We try to make our worldview more complete from the time we're done until we're dead. So saying that a worldview doesn't have an explanation for X is not a criticism of that worldview that's valid. It's like saying evolution doesn't explain um, how to make a cup of tea. It's not supposed to. And if if you want to say that evolutionary theory doesn't explain this particular mutation, then that's not a failing of evolution. It's just a failing of our general knowledge. It, once we actually figure out what that explanation is, it becomes part of that in much the same way that it would be rolled into our worldview. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, man. I've enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, and I, I will try to email you, and I'll look up some of those links where you talk about things that you actually positively affirm yep. uh, to be true. Yeah, and not only are they positively affirmed, it's worth noting that they're not absolute certainties in most cases. But okay, great. Just tossing that out there. Thanks. Thanks for yeah, the call. We'll talk to you later, Matt. Bye. Cheers. You pick. Who do we have? It's one, two, or three. Oh, well, this one's we give always. Um, hey, Mario, the first thing you need to do is turn down your stream. Hey, I'm sorry about that, Matt. That's all right. You didn't know we were coming directly to you. No, I did. I just saw you guys staring at it, and I'm like, I, until I heard you say my name. <laughs> so, cool. What have you got for us? Well, you know, I just wanted to, you know, I'm a Christian, and I've been ever since I, I was born. And um, Since you were born? I, I, since, you know. I mean, you know, and uh, but what I want to ask you is that I have I have had a lot of debates with uh, with Jews, mm -hmm. and they don't they seem not all of them, but like a high majority of them seem to cut out the Second Testament completely at all. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, an, an incredibly I, and incredibly high wanna, majority. I want to ask you since you read the Bible and you 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 were teaching the Bible and you were you know you know the Bible like the back of your hand, and I just want to ask well, you why okay. they think that or. What was your opinion on that? I have, a, I have just kind of a, and I'm sorry, this is just a question that I've got that's a little bit off to the side, but if you've argued with a lot of Jews about this, why don't you know why they reject it? Well, because I haven't really uh, put in the time to, you know, study the Bible and... Right, but have they not explained to you when you, when you talk to them about this subject specifically and ask them why they reject it, if it has, has anybody ever responded to that? You well, said, you said mean, you'd talk to Jews about it, and I'm saying, what have the Jews told you about that? Well, they, they, just, they just say that, uh, you know, that there was no Second Testament. Okay. And what and, do you, you say? Know, they, just, they, they seem to discredit uh, Paul. Okay. Well, and so that you know they don't accept Paul, right? They tell uh -huh, you that? Yeah. And what else have they told you? And uh, they just, some of them even say, like, outrageous things, like, like, it's, like it's a fraud or something, you know? It just... Okay. So they, they some I'm of them just, think I'm it's. I'm just trying to find. I, I would just you know what Matt's opinion was on that. You know. Or, I guess or I'm wondering why you don't believe what they're telling you. Like when they tell you this is why they don't accept it. What makes you think? Do you think they're? You do believe they're telling you the truth, right? Well, I mean, I, I just I, I see that they're telling me with a lot of what they believe. Um, with a lot of you know compassion that you know they truly believe that. So, sure. Sure. I mean, that's what I mean. I don't mean that they're telling you the truth that what they're saying is necessarily true, but they're telling you the truth about why they don't believe it. They're saying that this is what I believe is true, and that's why I don't believe this new, why I don't accept Christianity over Judaism, correct? Yes. Okay, so then they've explained to you why they don't accept the New Testament. Yeah, I just, I just thought that, uh, you know, uh, you guys had a, di a different perspective of it, you know. Yeah, we don't accept those. either. <laughs> I, I, no, no, I, as, far as, as far as the Second Testament. Yeah, I, okay, I can kind of see what's going on here, I think. I mean, it, Tracy's point, I, I don't want to trample all over it because it's, it's nice, which is you've basically called a bunch of atheists to ask why Jews don't accept Jesus um, <laughs> after talking to Jews. And I find that... Uh, a little humorous, but I also understand that you might not have gotten satisfactory answers. If you if you Google a little bit, you can find out because there are like Jews for Jesus groups, and there are people in opposition to that. But it's my everybody's going to have their own reasons, or there's going to be a number of different reasons for them rejecting um, the New Testament. Um, the biggest ones being that the verses that Christians 
cite as prophetic about the Messiah are not they're not an identical set to the verses that Jews consider prophetic about a Messiah and so if you go through the Old Testament and you pick out verses that you think are prophecies about the Messiah Christians will pick out this set and Jews will pick out this set and while there may be some overlap um, the idea of a Jewish Messiah was more of a warrior um, who would vindicate the Jews and, and take back Jerusalem, etc. And Jesus wasn't anything like that. Um, when, when this is brought up, there are some Christian apologists who say, well, he wasn't like that then, but boy, when he comes back, he will be. Well, okay, maybe when he comes back, you'll convince a bunch of Jews that he's the Messiah. Until then, I don't see why anybody's convinced. There's a lot of reasons. A lot of it has to come down to prophecy. A lot of it has to come down to... Um, I think Jews tend to understand their holy scriptures a lot more than Christians do as a general rule because of the way that they're raised with this instruction. Um, a, lot of, a lot of Christians, or at least Protestants in particular, eh, maybe some Catholics too, they're raised with the feel-good parts and we're going to go to vacation Bible school and we're going to sing about Jesus on the bus and we're going to learn John 3.16 and the gifts of the Spirit and we're never going to look at slavery, rape, abortion. We're only going to look at the verses about a Messiah that we already presuppose to have been fulfilled and we're going to ignore those verses that the Jews would point to and say, look, this right here is a prophecy about a Messiah. Um, I, I can't give you much more than that. I wish I could, uh, that, but if you thanks, go, if, if you do a that's, search, that's, go ahead. That's all, I, that's all I wanted to know. That just thank you for pointing me in the direction. That's all. Sure. Thank do you. do a Google search for Jews for Jesus and Jews against Jews for Jesus, and uh, okay. the second one might not get you the correct results, but something along those lines will. And then go for Jews against Jews against Jews for Jesus. Or you could go, you could Google Jesus Messiah <laughs> controversy, and I'll bet you find some good results that way. Yeah. But Google is definitely your friend. Well, good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. All right, we got like six minutes left or so. I think this one's been on for a while. Yeah, uh, Christopher in Baltimore. Thank yeah, you for hello. waiting through most of the whole show. Yes. Yeah, hello. Hey, you're on, Christopher. Hi. Hey. And I had a question. Now, in a previous episode, Matt said that he thinks that the most likely example for Jesus is that he's a legend. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is that the liar, lunatic, or lord omits a fourth possibility of legend. Now, um, so do you believe that, like, Jesus was a historical person? Like, there was a historical person existed? Can I try one? Go. Robin Hood. Was he real or was he... Yeah, or not. I guess, yeah. Uh, do you know? Uh, I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know either. And to be honest, nobody knows. There are some people who think that it probably was based on a real person. Some people think it was based on a conglomeration of real people. And some people think it might just be stories. But the reality is it could have been somebody that spawned those stories. But the stories, by the time we got them, were based on songs that were sung in pubs that then became the legends that blah, blah, blah. And if there was a real person at the root of that, would it matter at this point? Um, well, I guess I was just thinking that if there was a real person, mm -hmm. I was thinking, like, what would be the motivation behind him to create this? Like, Did he? If he did, did if he was responsible, I'm just saying. It yeah, was I mean, we wouldn't even know that. If, if I can't say that I know there was a person there, and, I, and I'm willing to accept that there could have been and that most scholars would say there likely was a historic Jesus that deviates in some ways from the Bible stories, I'll accept that. I mean, that seems okay to me. There's a, there are legends built from real people. So I'll look at that and I'll accept it. Now when somebody starts asking why would Jesus do this or why would Jesus do Now we're getting into details of the life of somebody who we're, pre, we're supposing existed. So now we're getting into like a hypothetical of a, of a, pre, of, of a, of a let's say a, a, a legitimate guess about somebody's existence and, and I don't know how much we could really posit their motivations without even starting from a standpoint of more, like, I guess, more solid foundation of this person existed and we know who, in fact, this was. Okay. Um, now, another 
question. I'm getting, I read this website, it was called like why-jesus.com, um, although I'm agnostic, but I was looking at it, mm-hmm. to see like um, what their they claim to provide evidence. One of the things they were saying was that, um, is that the legendary doesn't seem to um, say why all it has created like history, like the Romans, um, I guess persecuting Christians, or why would the oh, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, we have religions being persecuted all over the planet, generally by other religions, sometimes by governments, by secular governments. But I mean, religion being persecuted happens all the time. Why is that odd that it would happen in Rome to the Jews, or to an or Jewish early sect of Christians? I mean, if, if I'm not saying it's made up. I'm not saying Christians weren't persecuted. I guess I'm asking why it's relevant. Um, I don't know, I guess it was just trying to prove it. Um, it's, it's kind of an argument like, if, if this isn't true, how did it become so popular? Yeah. And that's like, like that. asking if Justin Bieber isn't talented, how did he become so popular? <laughs> People like what they like, and some things become popular even if you don't happen to, to you know, like them. Look um, how popular Nazism was in yeah. Germany. Uh, but but on the on the on the Jesus front, because we're we're closing in on almost out of time, I, I'm with Tracy, and I've talked about it before in the sense that when we talk about did this person exist as a historical figure, um, we have to go through and be very careful about what we're defining, because if all we can say about the person is that it's very probable that there was possibly someone upon whom these stories are based. That's not very strong. So when you say, do you believe Jesus was a historical figure, my answer has to be no. But my answer isn't, I believe it's entirely a fiction. It may be the case that there is a real person there. So if there was, what do we know about that person? What can we identify? What, what do we reasonably, what can we reasonably say is true about events that are specific to that individual's life? Well, I don't see any good reason to accept any of the various miracle, miracle claims surrounding his life. Many of the more mundane claims about, for example, I, I guess Herod slaughtering all the kids under two isn't necessarily yeah. mundane, but it's not a miracle. Right. Um, but I would say like it's more likely he lived in the Mideast than Australia. You know, if there's a real yeah. person at the core, there's going to be certain things that you can say, well, okay, it would be reasonable that he was in the region that all these writings are talking about and that he wasn't off in France somewhere. You know, I mean, so, but, but yes, when you start to get into things like why would he have done this, now you're talking about a mental motivation for somebody that we're trying to, de- to even determine the most, like, broad facts about. And, and those are facts on a, of, in the sense of the person not even really being able to say that, we, that he existed solidly. Yeah, my, my big thing is that if all I can say about a person is that maybe they existed, but we don't really know very much about them, and the stories that we have about them aren't aren't reliable, we don't have any autographs, we don't have any good evidence supporting them, um, then can, is it really worthwhile to say that this person existed? I, I don't see how it is, but I understand that the existence is very much tied to the message there, and that's why it keeps coming up over and over again. And I, apolo- I, I, I apologize, I apologize, we are, we are completely out of time. They've even put the credits up on the screen. Thanks, everybody who called in. We'll be back again uh, next week. And next Saturday is Austin Pride Festival. Come on down. We'll have a booth out. Bye-bye. How did we run out of time? Bummer. <laughs>